Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Podcast. True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 272 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. <laughs> Today, recording day is Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. And it is going to be, well, whatever the weather outside is, it is a lovely day at the Beaver Lodge, kids and cubs, because Santa Beaver has prezzies for you this morning. Oh, I can't wait to deliver them to you. Uh, we have a Wednesday morning nibble for you, and a big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. And with me, as always, looking, hey, 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 giving snaps, very fine, is our Mr. Grizzly. Ooh, damn. You look good, sir. How's your mental health today? Why? Thank you very much, sir. Um, mental health, I think, is okay. Uh, it's, I've got a big meeting today, so, you know, suit up. I'm not going to put a tie on, though. I, you, you know, it's, no, you okay. I have lots of ties. I used to. I wore them every day for about a decade when I was in sales, and uh, I uh, I still have lots of them. I like to wear them, but I don't need to, so yep, I'm not going to. Hey. Uh, but uh, every day this week, I've been waking up feeling hungover, and I've not had anything to drink. Yep. So it's you know it's that it's I don't know if it's the if it's the seasonal affective disorder, the lack of daylight, the um, Mild insomnia. I'd say mild because I've been able to fall asleep easily, but I light sleep. I don't think think I've been getting much in the way of REM sleep. So, yeah, I'm a little um, off kilter to say the least. But yeah, I'm in good spirits. All right, well, good spirits, man, and I look good. So. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, my friends, it's not how you feel; it's how you exactly. Look. You look marvelous. Exactly. Exactly. You need to be a certain age. To <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. All right. Um, well, kids, um, first, I need to start off with a, a gentle correction on myself. Um, and uh, it's yesterday I was talking about uh, polls in Quebec, and I was mentioning um, François Legault had uh, dropped mm -hmm. down to 19% support. That was a mistake on my part, uh, a big one. 
because according to 338.com, uh, which is the poll aggregator, they take all the polls and they put them together. They give them weights and the most recent polls have more weight and based on the quality of the pollsters and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't, uh, they're down to 19%. They're down to 25% and the Pazza Québécois has 31. The number 19 relates, and I don't know if Mr. Grizzly has it there, to their seat projection. Yeah, it's on the screen. It yeah. Should be anyway. Seat projection. So they're in third place if there was an election, I guess. And considering if you look all the way to the left of the screen where they were at the election, they came up with about like 90 seats or so. Yeah, rather precipitous drop. Yeah. The Liberals are ahead of them. And Quebec Solidaire, if you see the orange line going up, they're at 15. Mm -hmm. They're on the verge of overtaking them. And QCP, who is That's that? That's the Quebec Conservative Party. They yeah. have one now. Yeah. Because okay. they thought with uh, the, the well, declaring the death of the Parti Québécois and of separatism a little early, that uh, Quebec was going to now fold back into the, will fold into the regular conservative versus liberal, which is why in the last election you had the Quebec Conservative Party actually having press conferences in English only a couple mm -hmm. of times, We're saying, hey, liberal voters, you know, if you're federalists, you no longer have, well, federalist voters in Quebec, you no longer have to just vote liberal, now you can vote conservative because separatism is dead. Turns out maybe not so much. Mm. I don't think it's really very much alive, well, to be honest with you. It's, yes. I think it's, on it's, it's not it's separatism, deathbed. actually. Now the Pelsi Québec, it's just, you know, they have two parties, the CAQ and the Parti Québécois and Québec Solidaire that are, you know, that are representing Quebec interests primarily uh, over a federal uh, federalist option. And um, it seems that uh, quite very soon that the CAQ may be the least of these three options. Almost a bit like an ADQ back in the day, remember? They, with Mario Dumont, they came for a while and then they were, they were official opposition for a bit and then they just vanished and imploded just gone uh so the caq might eventually have the same fate interesting stuff but since we were talking about polls <laughs> there is some new stuff that has come out lately uh and i'm going to um start with, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, Nick Nanos. Nick Nanos. Um, there's some very interesting things that have been happening with uh, Nick Nanos polling. Now, Nanos polling, you have to understand, Kits, is a four-week rolling poll. So they go out weekly. Mm -hmm. And then when this week's poll comes on, the one of four weeks ago drops off. And it goes that way. So last week, well, two weeks ago, there was seemed to be a little bit of movement. But last week, some lot of movement came along. And because it's a four-week number, of course, it has the three previous weeks bolstering up the current number, the most recent number. So it doesn't look like such a precipitous drop when you look at their overall number. But when you look at the specific number, for December 8th. So this is November 24th. You see that the Liberals have 52 seats nationally, right? And the Conservatives have 213. And Ontario, the Liberals have 12. The Conservatives, 97. And uh, in Atlanta, Canada, the Liberals were down to two. And the Conservatives up to 23. You go one week later. Slight movement. Liberals up four seats to 60. Up five seats in Atlantic Canada. Up three seats in Ontario. And then go to December 8th. Boom. Yeah. Liberals up to 96 seats, 19 in Atlantic Canada to the Conservatives 11. So two weeks prior, the Conservatives had 23 seats. They've lost half of them in two weeks. And Liberals in Ontario at 30, Conservatives down to 79. Now, of course, this is still majority territory for the Conservatives, but these are big drops, very oh, yes. big drops. And then I was wondering, yeah, let's go well, back gee, to the beginning. From 213 down to 190, right? And, but the, yep. the, the change in liberal seats is huge from it's huge. 52 
to 96. That's a big jump. That's a huge yeah. jump. But, you know, oh. and I still say to, to everybody who's every time, and I encounter this on almost daily when, you know, there'll be a, uh, like the national dental program or something program gets announced and then you'll have a, a con bot troll that'll come in and go, look at the polls, look at the polls to which I always respond. That's, that's nice dear, but come to us in October of 2025 when the election's actually taking place. Oh, and remember who was leading in the polls in the last three elections, if memory serves and who won. So what do the poll mean? It means nothing. And two years out, it means less than nothing. It's that. So you know how I feel about polls. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but you know me. Mm -hmm. I love polls, but you got to take them for what they are, right? They are a snapshot in time. They've showed us where, they, where we've just been. So you got the Canada proud people putting up some tweets yesterday, I believe it was. And this one is particularly interesting. If you could put it up, Mr. Grizzly, for our kids, so. because this one made me smile a little bit. Because Nanos is showing a 14 point lead at the mm. moment. But just, just the week prior, Nanos was showing a 19 point lead. So that's a five point drop in one week on a rolling pool that has three weeks that are higher. So you mm. got the Canada proud people going, who's ready for an election? Pierre holds a 14 point lead over Trudeau in the latest poll, December 8th, 2023. Well, yeah, if um, in the space of one week, a 19 point lead dropped to a 14 point lead, I would want to go now too. Wouldn't I? <laughs> So then yesterday, David Coletto from Abacus Data says, oh, I've got some big stuff coming up because I can't tell you what it is. It's embargoed, but it'll be out tomorrow. And then later on, he said, hint, it is not, not that the NDP has overtaken the liberals for second place. So that immediately made me think, hmm, is David Coletto's data from Abacus going to confirm the movement we've been seeing with Nanos? Well, kids, apparently it does. And then some. Oh my, 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 my. So if you look in the Toronto Star, there's an article by Stephanie Levitz that came out that uh, reveals what uh, abacus has been saying but i will let mr grizzly put a visual there because uh since i got up early this morning i you, you can share visuals you know that eh? yeah but it's easier this way because i only have one screen here oh okay yeah in the the other room i have i have two when we set it up but here i only have one um this data is particularly juicy and you will see why it is that i am wearing my sequined christmas hat and plain santa beaver now i took uh the aggregate polling data from uh 338 the bottom one on this this uh visual and i created the top one based on the data in the article if you can click on the graphic uh mr grizzly there we go on November 11th, 2026, Abacus data had polled 2,417 Canadians and showed that the Liberals were at 23, the Conservatives were at 42, the New Democrats at 19, for a Conservative Party Canada lead of 19 points. In about 16 days, data from December 12th, 1,919 people polled. The Liberals are up 4 to 27. The Conservatives are down 5 to 37, which means a Conservative lead of 10. They've dropped 9 points, almost half in 16 days. Gee, I wonder what's been happening in the, over the past 16 days. Hmm? Betraying Ukraine, 
voting no on everything, calling everybody anti-Semites. Yeah. And all Doesn't other matter. stuff, right? Um, this is absolutely delicious data. If you keep scrolling down, Mr. Grizzly, uh, on the tweet thread. So the honeymoon is over. And remember, I kept on saying this is the kicking the tires phase. And there's a new leader and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. That part is over. Completely and totally over. Um, and in a spectacular fashion because these are biggest drops. Now, the last poll from any polling company at all, all of them combined, that had the spread at 10 points or fewer was a Nanos one on September 9th, 2022. The last Abacus poll specifically that had the spread at 10 points or fewer was in early August, August 5th. That means in just about two weeks, Skippy the Wonder Pigeon, by just being himself, mm. right, all the work that the Conservative Party of Canada has done over the past four months. The fake over has completely bombed. He is now officially a liability to his party. It's incredible. And both the 14 point spread, and remember, it's a four week rolling spread, which means that more drops are probably going to come as the high numbers that are inflating it roll off. And the Abacus 10 point spread are both lower than the 15 point spread that 338 showed on December 10th. So that means that when we get those numbers next Sunday, when they come out on the aggregate pool, that is going to drop too. And when those start dropping, then the conservatives start to panic. Now, the conservatives, of course, they always get their uh, internals. All parties get their internals. So maybe that's been explaining why the conservatives have been ratcheting up on, on, on the volume on calling all liberals anti-Semites. Because that they're... Ta didn't, didn't, didn't the prime minister just call for a ceasefire? Yes. So the prime minister called for a ceasefire. There was a vote at the UN. And there was the announcement of the wartime effort on housing. And uh, there was something else I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a, ah, I wish I could remember it. But there's a series of two or three or four things that the liberals are doing that are all winners in terms of public opinion. And the conservatives against all of them and so well, we're going to have a very difficult time explaining how it is that they support israel this while having voted against funding for the vancouver jewish community center and the montreal holocaust museum day that skippy went to a Hanukkah ceremony, which now people have to doubt whether or not that was because he actually believed in it or because he was already going to Point Claire for $1,700 a plate dinner at a Montreal steakhouse and decided to just stop in at the Hanukkah event to provide himself with a little cover. It would seem he voted remotely. Mm -hmm. which he had said he was a dead set against. Yes. So he went to a synagogue that had been firebombed, but vote against funding for a Holocaust museum in the same city. His love for the Jewish people is about as deep and wide as his love for the Ukrainian people. It well, seems that the only reason he attended the event and remind you, let's remind you that by attending that event, he stopped all 
other MPs from being able to mm-hmm. the first day of Hanukkah in their writings mm-hmm. and separated Jewish MPs from their community, then their family and their children on the first day of Hanukkah. But he's going to wrap himself in that Israeli flag and say, hey, Jewish people, I'm with you. Clearly, he is not. At some point, it's going to be about what he does and not what he says. And I suspect that more support will drop. Well, look, I'm going to pause it. I'm going to ask a question. I'm just asking a question here. Right. I'm just asking a question. So there's the accusation about how, um, and, and a founded, well-founded accusation about how India helped get him elected into his current position. Yes. Well-founded because there's lots of documentation to back it up. I'm not, yes. that's not even speculation. That's fact. Right. But when he keeps voting against the Ukraine free trade agreement and funding for the war in Ukraine to support Ukraine, and the rumors about his connections to Russia and Putin. And we've had David Wallace in the past say that he's a Russian mm-hmm. asset. Mm-hmm. Paint by numbers is putting together a portrait of he's in Putin's pocket. Oh, yes. I'm just asking the question because all the evidence certainly points to that. And when you have an insider say that, oh, no, he's definitely in Putin's pocket. You know, <laughs> don't forget, uh, Doug Ford had back channels to Russian money. I'm not making it up. It's all been proven. It is. All documented. It has indeed been proven. And um, the India stuff is pretty big. And it's not that I am going to avoid it, but I'm working on getting a guest uh, on the show. Um, who writes for the Hill Times, uh, whose beat is foreign affairs. Don't give the and, name away. No, no, won't give the name away. Uh, whose beat is foreign affairs. So I'm saving that to have this discussion uh, okay. with him. Uh, but yeah, the India stuff Jeez. is definitely looking way, 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 way stickier. Um, because well, there were two moves. One, there was a move to bar a certain candidate from attending events that were in support of the Indian diaspora in Canada. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, someone else getting a lot of support, including possibly the purchase of lots of memberships. Yes. Yes. A Tsar is born. <laughs> I love that graphic. Oh, um, it's... So, which leads to us wondering, and I, I and I, I put the question to Sarah Fisher, who's the communications person of the Conservative Party of Canada, who, of course, never seems to answer my questions, but wondering, um, what is the Conservative Party of Canada doing to get to the bottom of this India thing? Because um, at the time, I voted in the leadership race because I did put down $10 to buy a membership to vote mm-hmm. in that race. Um, did I vote in a race that was a fraud? Mm-hmm. Did the party commit fraud? And if the party did not commit fraud, if the party honestly was not aware that this was going on, then the fact that this has been now three or four days that this story is out, and that the party has not addressed it in any way and has not told any of its membership what it plans to do to get to the bottom of this, how the perpetrators will be punished. Well, remember their language and their specific words. We want, we want to investigate interference with Beijing. Beijing interference, he doesn't say China, never says the name of the nation because he's in bed with China and was years ago. But we're only investigating Beijing and no one else. Mm-hmm. When, when Jagmeet Singh stood up in the House of Commons and said, we need to inv- investigate every country, including Russia and India. No, no, no. 
just Beijing. And just the last two elections. Yes. Nothing prior. Just the last two federal elections. Nothing mm-hmm. else. Not his leadership campaign to become mm-hmm. the leader of the now, when there is, Christo-Fascist party. Yes. Now, when there is news that your political party may have been breached. Remember when Pierre Polyev decided to play that car explosion as a terrorist attack and his question was it is the duty of the prime minister to keep people safe could he tell us what his action Mm -hmm. plan is well isn't it the duty of the conservative party of canada to make sure that its leadership vote is not compromised by foreign officials and out of respect to its membership and keeping its membership vote safe what is it doing and what is its action plan The question can be posed to it. And they have had radio silence, which makes the party and its leader look extremely weak. It's just bad. The party and the leader are weak. They cannot even defend their own party against interference. And when there is news of it, they remain quiet. How are they going to defend Canada and Canadians? if they can't even maintain their own party. And this now would make three federal conservative leadership races in a row that are not clean. And they are the only party that seems to not be able to run a clean leadership race. Once again, leading credence to my call for Canadians to come to the conclusion that this party most certainly does not deserve to form the government but shouldn't even be the opposition. There is something rotten in the state of conservatism. Well, from David Hamer, when Mr. Coyne, Andrew Coyne that is, is taking seriously the allegations about India interfering in the piffle swip Pierre Polyev's ascent to the conservative leadership, you know that party has a problem. And the headline, or the byline, I guess you could say, is uh, did China and India meddle in the conservative leadership race from Andrew Coyne? Now, it's an opinion piece, but if it's his opinion, Mm -hmm. that's telling. Yep. Now, he's he's been leaning conservative and supporting conservative for a long time now. Oh, yes. In his writings. I don't know what his personal politics are. Mm. And um, this article from India about India that appeared in the Bureau was preceded on November 29th, I believe it was, by another article about something going on with China as well. That doesn't make the conservatives look good. And uh, that's another subject that I would like to get into uh, with our guest uh, when we are able to secure him. Um, But yeah, this is not looking good. And when you combine that with the fact that um, there seems to be some rogue rogue elements within CSIS, and there's uh, Bruce Anderson Mm -hmm. um, put out an actual call that says that the prime minister should probably be firing the head of CSIS and cleaning house. And there's some interesting news out of the United States because when the prime minister made his first allegations publicly against India and the conservatives were like, oh, see, he's got no friends, nobody's backing him up. And then the Secretary Blinken in the United States came and said, oh, no, 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 we can back that up. And uh, it's like, so can our five eyes, allies, partners. We have some information on that. And then a few weeks after that, there were uh, there was a charge, charges in the United States laid against someone who is part of the part of the same plot, allegedly, that led to the death of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. The extrajudicial killing by allegedly a foreign nation of a Canadian on Canadian soil. And that there was a plot foiled there. 
and that probably by his actions, the prime minister actually saved three or four other people from being killed in the same manner. Well, conversely, not conversely, but also in the United States recently, there was the discovery that they had someone who was a double agent since the 1970s. Mm-hmm. And they didn't uncover him until just now. Almost 50 years. So if the United States that has all the money, all the resources, and is really, really hung up on national security. Oh, yes. I mean, we saw what happened after September 11th. Have to take off our shoes and everything. Yeah. And all the money they spent in it. If a person in the United States can go undetected since the 1970s, certainly there could be a rogue element within ceases here. No doubt. Because we certainly don't not put that much money into it, especially into verification. Well, there's a lot of money that goes into verification. A lot. Not as much as the I, United I know States. I've gone down that road. No, no, no. Uh, it's because they have a lot more resources yeah. than we do, and and they are much more risk averse when it comes to yes. that. Because you know, they're, they're the most hated nation. Right? Yes. Right. Now we we've certainly made some enemies because we're standing up for democracy. We're standing up for uh, a way of life that we believe in is everybody gets a vote, everybody has a voice, everybody has their say, everybody has the ability to say it. And there are leaders within the International Democratic Union, of which Stephen Harper is the leader, that do not like that. They call themselves the International Democratic Union, but there's nothing democratic about the way they operate or organize or run that organization. They are a bunch of despot fascist dictators. Well, Fascist, I think, is probably a better term than dictators because they do use force to try and make their their point. This this we're we're in a, we're on the we're on the edge here, folks. Don't, don't kid yourself. We are on the edge here. It's it will not happen overnight. But if we do not get involved politically, starting at the municipal level when it comes to school boards, start there, and look how they've worked their way in and work their way up, and how they have a long game for this. Now, the difference between Polyev and Stephen Harper is Stephen Harper was, as you said, the king of incrementalism. He knew how to play the long game. Polyev, nah, he's in a rush to be be the most powerful man in Canada, and he'll do anything to get it, to the point where he's probably going to be taken to the woodshed by Harper pretty soon, if he hasn't already been, because we've not heard very much out of him in the last five days other than him standing up in the house of commons and saying that ukraine is a faraway foreign land there's a lot of canadians buried in foreign faraway lands and isn't israel a foreign faraway land too so and further away further away Mm -hmm. it's and again uh, somebody pointed it out yesterday because you it's very, very, very important to know your history. Mm-hmm. History. I'm saying it doesn't doesn't repeat, but it certainly certainly rhymes. Oh yes. And um I believe that it was um Neville Chamberlain. Mm-hmm back in the days of the Second World War, when he was uh, trying to not get involved, said something like, a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Mm -hmm. September 27th, 1938, in reference to growing British anguish over German Chancellor Adolf Hitler's ambition to take Czechoslovakia. So yeah, we have um, <laughs> Pierre Polyev standing in the house and talking about something in a land far away. 
far away, far away foreign land. Far away his words. foreign land. And just for um, shits and giggles, um, because you know me, I look this stuff up. Distance from Canada to Ukraine, according to map data, copyright 2023, 7,740 kilometers. Distance from Canada to Israel, from the same group, 9,644 kilometers. One land is even more far away. Mm -hmm. But By Ukraine is a faraway foreign land, but Israel is not. Wonder why that is. Somebody in the House of Commons should ask him that very inconvenient question. Why is Ukraine being singled out for special treatment? Well, again, like I said, if you're in the pocket of Vladimir Putin, and, you know, the, the paint-by-numbers picture certainly forms that uh, picture. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's here, I, I have the quote. I have the quote right here, actually. Let me just put it up on the screen for you so you can see it. It's, um, this is exactly what he said in yeah. the House of Commons yesterday. People say they'll never be able to afford a home. We understand with this miserable record, he doesn't want to talk about Canada or Canadians. He'd rather spread falsehood about lar faraway foreign lands, Mr. Speaker. Will he not stand up for once for Canada, ax the tax or our families? People say they'll never be able to afford a home. We understand with this miserable record, he doesn't want... This from a man who lied about standing in the commons until the tax was axed mm -hmm. and that lied about not voting for the Ukraine free trade deal, which President Zelensky signed when he was here last in Canada mm -hmm. because of carbon tax. And then who did not approve funding recently for a charity, also based on the same reason, carbon tax. It seems that for some reason, absolutely every policy, every initiative that the government wants to take up comes second to not having a carbon tax. Wonder why that is. Oh, by the way, did you hear that Daniel Smith is in Qatar? Yes. Yeah. After spending, what, 10 days in Dubai? Mm -hmm. mm. Tea. Tasty, tasty tea. Ay, 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 kids. It's literally right in front of us, and we really need some people in mainstream media to start connecting the dots for everyone I'm, I'm, because I'm not hopeful. everybody watches this show no but i'm hopeful that there are individuals in mainstream media who are doing the work in the background right now and they're going to wait until all the t's are dotted all the all the i's are dotted all the t's are crossed let's get that right. <laughs> yeah dot the t's <laughs> cross the i's yeah dot the t's We're cross rebels. the i's <laughs> We're on matching socks. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, I th I'm hopeful that there's somebody in mainstream media doing that. I mean, Sam Cooper just did. You know, Scooper Cooper did the the thing on India. He was the one who helped bring that to light. So, you know, he 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 basically lost his job over the uh, story about how um, who was it the uh, member of parliament, liberal member of parliament, who they they said, oh, he told them to keep. Yeah. The Mike, two Michaels in prison when that was not the case. Yeah. It was a mix up. And, anyway, I believe. And, and then he was, you know, and, and I will say this I, Cooper was hung out to dry on that one. His editor signed off on it. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who lost his job. I'm like, well, yep. come on, there's more than one guilty party there. However, with that story, we also have to remember that the Globe and Mail would not publish part of it. Right. Which, you know, and we on this show, myself personally, uh, was a little skeptical 
of that part of the reporting, which leads some people to say, hey, if you were skeptical about that part, then you should be skeptical about this part. To which I say, yes, but that particular part of Cooper's reporting was, was not corroborated and another media wouldn't follow up. Mm -hmm. The second part on China, which just came up on the 29th, seems to be way more backed up. And the part about India has been corroborated not only by Secretary Blinken in the United States, but our five ice partners and charges <laughs> against someone. So, yes, a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism is required, but a healthy dose not skepticism for, skepticism for the sake of it, but a healthy dose. But it also relates to the quality of the sources at the time. Now, the quality of the sources on the story of Hang Dang saying, hey, 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 can't release the two Michaels just yet, may not have been solid. But there's way more corroborating evidence on the other ones. Hmm? It is very, very, very interesting. Again, someone that has a budget and has the resources because we don't really needs to grab a shovel, start digging, or finding the spot on the body where it hurts when you press, and then just dig that finger in in there. I, I, Make a couple of people say, ow. I have to question something here. Let me show you something and, and mm -hmm. draw your own conclusion, folks. But we all already know that Pierre Polyev does not exactly get his uh, news or his, his source information from Nissi Cop because he's not cleared to do it. We know he gets his information from Fox News, probably Newsmax, probably OAN. I don't think he's going to Canadian sources because he spouted off American sources when the Canadian sources hadn't said. He can't even handle CP, Canadian press, right? So here's the tweet. The Conservative Party has again voted against the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement in the House of Commons despite calls from the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress to vote in favor of the deal. The Liberals, NDP, Bloc, and Green Party all voted in favor. Now, let me just scroll down here to one of the um, perhaps 4chan-influenced comments that I debunk immediately. It's this individual. That's good. No more money when President Zelensky buys two luxury lots for $75 million. You can see this is yep. about corruption, not about the war. Is that why he's voting against it? Because, look, I've got a little story here from uh, AP News that uh, will um, uh, corroborate that he did not buy luxury lots. Yeah, the odds, they're still up for sale. Yep. And the other thing is, this is a thing that's big in the United States. Um, the people that are saying this are counting you on, counting on us not knowing that when the United States says that we're going to spend about like $1 billion on arms to help Ukraine, those million dollars are spent in the United States mm -hmm. to make the arms and then the arms are shipped. It's not like somebody is loading pallets of money onto a plane and bringing them to Zelensky here you go, so sir. that he can spend it as he wants. And same here in Canada, right? They usually go to our defense industry or defense just, industries of countries with whom we have agreements. It's, it's not like we write a check No, I, I, to Zelensky. I'm just really disturbed by the willful ignorance, the gleeful willful, igno willful ignorance to support their bias confirmation echo chamber theory. Because if you're believing this story that has been debunked more than once, and you still believe it with all your might, I think you're lost. I, I, yeah. I, 
I, I, I'm struggling to say what I'm about to say, but I think there's no hope for you. If you will not believe that which I can show you is fact, you're gone, man. You're lost. You're out in the bush. And it, it's really troubling to me when there is a small percentage of the population that has always believed in this ridiculous conspiracy theory. Now, I'm yeah. not saying that particular one, but in ridiculous conspiracy theories. There oh, are yes. people who are always going to believe them, no matter what. They will not believe what they can see with their own eyes if it doesn't suit their narrative. And that is very troublesome. And there are more and more people saying this. Now, that being said, I don't let it get to me that much because I realize a lot of this are just bought farms paid from Russia. Right. With conservative funds, maybe? Uh-huh. Maybe. Maybe. I'm I'm. I'm just, just asking, asking questions. questions. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly bought with. Um, and as Kit, the anti-corporatist, says here, sometimes they're even older weapons that were slotted to be destroyed and they ship their old ones to Ukraine and they manufacture new ones for the U.S. Army. Indeed. Indeed. Mm-hmm. You have been paying attention. Ah, Mr. Grizzly, how are we doing for time? Um, I got a little bit more. I'm working nine to nine today, so I'm going in for eight thirty. So, oh, okay, uh, cool. Yeah, I have a very long day. If I get home before nine thirty tonight, I'll be lucky. E, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll bring an extra stick of deodorant because. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a long day, right? It's you know, you know how the human body works. That, I mean, that, that's that, that would be a long day indeed. Yeah, it's at least 12, 13 hours. So, um, yesterday you mentioned uh, someone named Sean Rouse mm-hmm. uh, because he uh, and you had uh, He's posted a, good a tweet of his. He's a very good follow. Uh, but you had posted a tweet of his that had listed, list. I'm having trouble with my past tense today. <laughs> uh, a dangling participle. <laughs> <laughs> that had uh, listed um, a couple of claims about PP's housing video mm. uh, that uh, needed to be checked into. Um, and uh, I went to look at that tweet uh, that you recommended and a um, really interesting thing happened um, because I, I took a look at it and I noticed that there were four quotes there. Uh, mm-hmm. They're basically community notes that have been put on his thing that are not up yet because they're still waiting to get enough support. And there are three, I'll read the, uh, the, the three last ones first, and then I'll read the first one. The third one is, the video claims that the Bank of Canada is influenced by the presiding government in Parliament. This is misleading as the Bank of Canada is highly independent of government by design. Its job is to provide monetary policy that is best for the economy, not the government. Well, and the point before that, I think, is valid, too, that you've yeah, talked hold on, about hold on. Yeah, hold on, yeah, hold on. Uh, that's why I said I'm going to save the point before that for last. Mm-hmm. Third point, Trudeau elected late 2015, housing prices were already rising. Peaked in 2017, then Trudeau government changed legislation, thus a decline in prices. A clear downward trend was occurring. COVID interrupted the trend. Video doesn't mention main reasons for prices rising was COVID. And the fourth one is, this video repeatedly refers to housing prices rising over the last eight years, the term of the Liberal government. However, housing prices started their accelerated increase around 2003, especially in major cities. Below is a graph of Vancouver prices from 1977 to 2016. And the first one... I'll show you that graph. Yes, please do. Just a sec here while I get it up. Bring this up on screen. Here we are. I got to minimize it a bit. It's a little bit too, I blew it up to 200%. So everybody could, oh, there, that's too much. Let's trip in. There we go. That works. I think we can see that. Let me close that. There we are. All right. So let's show this on screen. Posted February 21st, 2016. Updated August 4th, 2016. Residential average sale prices. Detached condo. Whoops. Get off my screen. What's going on there? Detached condominium attached in apartments. <laughs> Detached homes. Yep. 1.8 million. But see that nice little spike going up where 2003 mm-hmm. starts? That's where it starts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
just starts to go way up. Yep. I had a bit of a dip in 2008 and a bit of a dip in what, 2012, but. Yep. Now the first one that is cited on that tweet from Sean Rouse is, the housing crisis in Canada was kickstarted in 1984 when the conservative government of Brian Mulroney slashed national affordable housing spending by $2 billion in its 10 years in office. Successive governments cut more or didn't act until 2017 when a national housing strategy emerged. I uh, had to write to him on that one saying that we uh, quoted him and said, um, mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, I said, thank you for this, Sean. By the way, I recognize the first suggested clarification. It happens to be one I made from my personal account. <laughs> nice. I paid a pissy beaver. He goes, awesome. I voted for it. Hopefully it shows up soon. Thanks for your work. <laughs> As I, Thanks so much. I'd done some research on how we got here beyond after eight years of Justin Trudeau for our show and learned a lot, which is what I shared with the kids. My co-host mentioned your tweet on our show this morning. <laughs> well, and, and let's go back to his original tweet in response to Blaine Higgs, wondering why home prices are out of reach for many. Watch this. Pierre Polyev's documentary in, in parent uh, quotations because he he conveniently left out a lot of facts oh yes this pp post has several suggested clarifications that will soon show up under this specious claim and here's the important part not that i'm a super trudeau fan i just don't like seeing you outhouse amplify neocon nonsense and outhouse is uh is is an actual person by the way um and he is i don't know why he doesn't show up in this tweet thread but uh, I found him somewhere. Anyway, he's a, he's a guy here in Ottawa, and he spouts off stuff constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, Sean Rouse is a satire writer for the Manatee magazine. So, but he, you know, to, in order, in order to, be able to to be able to write political satire, you have to be very informed to then satirize it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something very interesting that happened in. Uh, New Brunswick yesterday, it seems that uh, the premier, Blaine Higgs, forced a passage of a law over objections from opposition parties with regard to pensions. And it seems that it did not go well. Um, I don't know if you have the, the link in some of the clips. Um, but it seems that yeah, when the great. vote was passed, um, there was a lot of ruckus in the gallery. Let's just have a look here. Total days 27, Ben said total days 19. He's now. It would appear that potentially Mr. Higgs has signed his own political death warrant. Oh, yes. The bill will become law on Wednesday, the final sitting day before Christmas, when Lieutenant Governor Brenda Murphy arrives at the legislature to grant royal assent to it and other pieces of legislation passed this fall, according to an article in CBC. Um, and it seems that, though Higgs is saying this, the legislation is necessary to fix a shortfall in the pension fund for affected local union locals. Um, it seems that nobody was for it. There's an underfund funded liability of $265 million in the pension plan. And this was his way to fix it. And he did it by, of course, limiting debate. About seven days ago, he limited debate on the union pension bill. Now, uh, 
this is not a new tactic from mm. conservatives trying to stiff public servants as either servants either of salary or pension benefits. The Pension Plan Sustainability and Transfer Act would force two QP locals in the education sector and three groups in the New Brunswick Council of Nursing Home Unions into a process to determine the future of their pension plans. It requires them to choose one of three different shared risk pension plans and for the transition to begin by February 1st. Shared risk pension plans. He's trying to impose that. Mm -hmm. on them and successfully in law has done it now i don't know if mr higgs is watching what's going on in quebec he's about that big public service strike Four hundred twenty thousand people yeah that's also not helping mr legault in his yeah. account hmm? um blaine and, higgs has basically signed his um and I don't want to use that term because it might get censored, but you know, the, political the death. Now. I always say political death. Political death, yes. Um, now, when he passed that limit on debate on the union pension bill, not only did he pass it, oh, no, no, no. He wrote it so that it would apply retroactively to all the time already spent on the bill. Yes. <laughs> Just, like dude dude really this is not the way yes earlier that week union leaders said some members might strike something that would be illegal but that qp said would match the violation of bargaining rights in the legislation i can't tell you what the members are prepared to do but whatever decision they make i can tell you that we as their leaders will support them said the leader of the union in New Brunswick at the time, Stephen Drost. Do, do you think the vast majority of New Brunswickers are regretting the decision they made when they last went to the polls? We need to change the government. Oops. Oops. And his, this is the thing I keep telling people. You see how bad the provinces are run by cons? Look at Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick. And even Nova Scotia to a lesser degree. Uh huh. The only one that's been run well is PEI, and yes, because they have a literal progressive conservative government. A little, literal progressive conservative, and they're doing okay. But you look at every other province run by a con and see the shape they're in, and look at Alberta's health care. It is destroyed. They are privatizing it as we speak. Yep. Actively doing this. So you look at these con governments, and you think Pierre Polyev is going to do any better for Canada? You think he's going to do anything to make your life better? You'll put more money in your pocket by taking away the services that you rely upon. Hey, look at that. My taxes were cut. I don't have to pay as much money. Uh, wh what do you mean I got to pay $1,200 a month in health insurance? Well, you don't have public insurance anymore, so now it comes out of your own pocket. But you get a powerful paycheck out of it, don't you? Ask your American cousins how they feel about the health care they have. If you don't work for a big corporation that gives you good health care, you're screwed. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The highest and amount of debt in the United States of America? Medical debt. Absolutely. That's the highest amount of bankruptcies in that country. Highest debt and highest bankruptcy levels. Medical debt. You want that? You want that, Canada? Elect Pierre Polyev, and that's what you'll get. I know, I know many people are dissatisfied with, with Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government. I know that, and I understand that. I have my issues with them too. But electing someone who will destroy your life to own the libs is the stupidest thing you could ever do. Biting off your own nose to spite your face is ridiculous. And this is what's being proposed. I, I just... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And the proof of that is that, for example, if we're talking about housing, right, where Pierre Poirier has been making a lot of noise 
for a lot of time saying, you know, oh, look at housing, look at housing. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, look at all this terrible thing. Um, well, he was just recently quoted as saying the government needs to get out of housing. So I'm confused. Yeah. Like very, very, very confused because if he is saying, he's been saying the whole time that he will fix it and look at my plan. But he's now saying that he needs to get out. Sean Fraser, on December 7th, the conservative leader said that the governments should get out of home building. Tonight, he doubled down by voting against 71,000 new apartments and, what, 15,500 new homes for our most vulnerable. Solving the housing crisis takes investment in housing, not costs. And he points to an article in the Victoria Times Colonist. It says, government should get, governments should get out of home building, Polyev says in visit to view royal construction site. So he was at a construction site and said government should get out. So we have, basically, if I was Pierre Polyev, this is what he's saying, but he doesn't say it. I lie that everything that is wrong about housing is Justin Trudeau's fault, but don't count on me to fix it because I believe government should get out of home building, though I've never told Doug Ford that. Well, and, it's and remember. all over the place. Well, remember, folks, remember Doug Ford. We're building homes, except the province isn't building anything. Nothing. The homes that are being built that Doug Ford keeps railing on about were by private for-profit developers. And I don't have a problem with private for-profit business if it doesn't harm the public purse. Right. We're a private for-profit business, but we're not harming the public purse. We don't get tax dollars. Matter of fact, we pay a lot of tax dollars just to run this show. Yep. Bandwidth, hello, all the equipment, that's all taxable. It... Yep. <sighs> yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, oh, my word. They're really something else. And um, here's something I would like to um, play for you, uh, Mr. Grizzly, because um, I'm going to talk about uh, the housing strategy uh, tomorrow, a little more. Okay. But um, Sean Fraser had this intervention a couple of days ago about Pierre Podiev and housing. That is um, intervention? really, really... Interaction? Pardon? You said intervention. Was that intentional? Intervention? Yes. Well, inter intervention. Yes. He, he, uh, maybe I'm thinking in French, but he said something. He made an intervention on, on, on the subject. Because an intervention is when we get together as a group and say, you've been drinking too much. We need to put you in. Yes. Home. I mean, like, inter that's where my yes. head goes. <laughs> I might, I, I might be, uh, I might be, uh, make, thinking, make, yeah, thinking in, in French, uh, but made us a, uh, made a statement, uh, and I would like Canadian, I would like our kids and cubs to see this because um, this guy is something else, Sean Fraser. Well, he, he I'm, I'm impressed with everything he's yep. done thus far. Let's have a look at this. When I actually compare the measures that we're putting on the table uh, to the measures that Mr. Polyev is proposing to advance, his plan will result in fewer homes being constructed than we are already on pace to build. Uh, moreover, I don't like the way he demeans people who can't afford a home. I don't like the way he describes co-op housing as Soviet-style housing. I don't like the way that he calls uh, a small uh, and modest home in Niagara a shack uh, for promotional purposes. I don't like the way he uses homeless people as props on his social media accounts. The reality is we have to ask ourselves, not how are we just going to tap into the anxiety that's very real in communities for our own political gain, but who are we trying to help at the end of the day? When I actually compare the measures that... Wow, that's... Um, I, more of that, please. Uh-huh. More of that. 
a lot more of that. Uh huh. Right. Well, and, and, and his tweet, he says, when I compare, uh, and his tweet, I'm going to read it here, when I can't compare the measures we're advancing to what the conservative leaders are proposing, as clear as plan will add red tape, increase the cost of home construction, and build fewer homes. When it comes to home building, it's time to invest, not make cuts. So he'll rail on about, we need homes, we need homes, we need homes. Okay, we're going to build homes. No, that's, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's literally... But we're going to build homes, not what I meant. And and here's the irony. So I had tweeted this. Um, so on Monday, I guess, I tweeted this in response to uh, Mackenzie Gray's uh, report in uh, on Global TV. Yes. I think it was Global? Yes, Global. So Mackenzie Gray, since, you know, nearly 80 years after it was first implemented, Global News has learned the Fed are reviving the CMHC's wartime housing in, in parent, uh, quotation marks, program to provide standardized blueprints to build, builders. Here's my scoop on how it could bring down costs and speed up new home builds. And my response to that was, well, actually, it was a, a, a quote retweet. So how will Dog Ford and Pierre Polyev spin this in a negative fashion? And how long before they do it? Indeed. Looks like Pierre already did it. Yep. I haven't heard anything from Doug in a bit, yep. but... And we'll talk more about that effort uh, on tomorrow's show. But about Sean Fraser, there was an article uh, that uh, appears in the Salt Wire mm -hmm. today, uh, posted about, uh, well, maybe, sorry, I'm not sure if it was today, maybe it might have been yesterday. And I'd like to read uh, a couple, uh, read a portion, we'll read it to you because it's an opinion piece, but it's really, really good. Um, the title of it is, it's from Ralph Suret. It's called Polyev, a nice guy, a Nova Scotian PM, and other stuff that's hard to believe. About that summer ad blitz intended to prove to the world that Tory leader Pierre Polyev is a nice guy after all and not a raving right-wing lunatic, Abacus Data, a polling firm, found that more people now consider him moderate, compassionate, and down-to-earth. A majority of those who feel they know him well saw him as genuine, strong, and compassionate. Plus, there's an increase in the number of Canadians who feel they have a good understanding of what he and his party stand for. So clearly, this didn't appear yesterday. This is a couple of days ago. There's just no date on it that I can see. I was just about to conclude that this might well be the most successful sucker job in Canadian history when Polyev suddenly flamed up again. Picking up reports from the no-facts Trump media, he lobbed out the notion in the comments that the accident at the Niagara Falls Bridge a couple of weeks ago was a terrorist attack, with some of these media holding it up as proof that a border fence is needed to keep out Canadian riffraff. And what was the pathetic, incompetent Trudeau doing about it? Question later about the episode, he reverted to form and attacked the questioner, a Canadian press reporter. One of his big plans, of course, is to wipe out the CBC, but it doesn't stop there, as he's made plain once again any journalist or media organization that asks him to explain himself is just a liberal NDP stooge doing their dirty work. Paranoia, despotism, deviousness, political revenge, and know-it-all absolutism go so nicely together, especially under the banner of nice guy common sense. Then the Tories voted against a Canada-Ukraine trade deal on the flimsy grounds that there was language that there indicated support for carbon pricing, although much less so than a pending Ukraine-European deal. Apart from demonizing the most promising method of dealing with this global warming and implying a Putin-friendly anti-Ukraine attitude, this vote told us something else. The role of conservatives, like the entire de Atlantic deputation, as opposed to the right wing radicals, will be to stand up on command and otherwise keep their mouths shut as Polyev and the prairie radicals run the show. I await the first peep of dissent and its consequences. Well, we actually know what that was like because it happened to Alain Reyes soon mm -hmm. after Pierre Polyev was voted leader. Mind you, Polyev returning to form after a temporary stint as an ad agency created Nice Guy. Ooh, that's delicious. May not do much to hold him back in the polling. The latest has him even further ahead with the liberals a hair away from third place behind the NDP. Not anymore. After all, if nearly half the American electorate can still be with Trump despite everything, will a solid chunk of equally gullible Canadians be any less thick-headed no matter what Polyev does? We are not immune to the populist wave rolling over the Western world and beyond, of which the template is Donald Trump. Europe was rattled recently as the Netherlands, a pillar of the European Union, elected Geert Wilders, who wants to take the country out of the Union, ban the Quran, and so on. And despite Argentinians 
and desperate Argentinians have just elected what looks like a mop-haired nutcase in Javier Malay, who wants to abolish the central bank as a climate skeptic, a staple among these guys, calls the Argentin Argentinian Pope a communist, himself an anarcho-capitalist, and his presidency a leap into the void. Different places are roiled by different things, and no one has a good feel for the cause of the general meltdown. Is it economics, culture, the internet? What? But on the whole, not a good time for democracy and its institutions, the free press, the independent judiciary, peace on the streets, and so on. But the Canadian angle to the story doesn't quite end there. The international media, where Justin Trudeau is still a bit of a rock star, are announcing that he's playing the Trump card. That is, trying to stick the Tories with the MAGA label and hope that a Trump tobacco will ensnare Polyev. That's unlikely to work, of course, since the larger part of this issue is that he himself has passed his best before date. The only thing that would rattle the cage would be if he quits. Rumbles are getting louder, and if he does, things might get more interesting still. Consider this. Central Canadian commentators are gaga about, wait for it, a Nova Scotia MP as his possible successor. He's Sean Fraser, housing minister and an MP for Central Nova. At 39, he's not only impressing as housing minister, he's said to be sharp, focused, and engaging on, large, on the larger politics. Plus, having gone to Ottawa in 2015 as a unilingual Anglophone, he's become impressively bilingual since. CTV commentator Don Martin called him, quote, the conservative's worst nightmare. Well, I'm seeing and hearing lots of stuff, and I have trouble believing these days, but let's keep an eye out as the drama unfolds. A Nova Scotian taking the country by scororm and saving the day? Good grief. What next? <laughs> well. Hey. Uh, hey. Right? Which brings us... Seldom am I without yes, words. Which brings us back to the initial polling from the beginning of the show. And... Um, I also want to, to read to you uh, the article by Stephanie Levitz because there's some very interesting data there. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev tried to boost his MP's morale with bags of fast food during a marathon voting session he forced over the weekend. But during that same session, public opinion was souring on him, a new poll suggests. The latest Abacus data survey provided exclusively to the Star reveals a 5 percentage point drop in support for Polyev's conservatives, an increase in those who have a negative opinion of Polyev, and a move away from him among those who think it's time for a change in government. While the Conservatives are still ahead of Liberals by 10 percentage points overall, the shift is notable, said Abacus Data CEO David Coletto, because the numbers also because the numbers don't show a corresponding positive change in how people think Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government is doing, nor do more people like Trudeau. Quote, it's not that people are saying, oh, all of a sudden I love what the Liberals are doing and I think the country's back on track, he said. It's more of, I'm still anxious about it. I still want change. I'm not any less fatigued with Trudeau, but maybe some of the things that conservatives have done this week is showing us their true colors. The pollster was in the field between December 7th and 12th, asking 1,919 Canadians nationally their thoughts on the current political status quo. It came at the end of a period where Trudeau and his ministers firmly went on the attack against Polyev, among other things, using his decision to vote down a free trade deal with Ukraine as a reason to accuse him and his party of trying to import extreme right politics to Canada. Over the last several weeks, the U.S., the Republicans have been holding up or outright blocking more aid for Ukraine, with some opposing it on ideological grounds while others are trying to exact progress on their own initiatives in exchange for backing the bill. While the Conservatives here have continued to say they support Ukraine, Polyev has claimed the free trade deal would impose what he calls a, quote, carbon tax on Ukraine and therefore shouldn't be signed. The deal does not do that, but commits both countries to, quote, promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risk. It has already been signed by Ukrainian President Vol Volodymyr Zelensky during his recent visit to Canada, and Ukraine, in fact, has already has a carbon pricing program. The poll was also underway in the aftermath of Polyev's threat to disrupt Trudeau's Christmas vacation by using procedural stall tactics in the House of Commons, including forcing over 130 votes on single-line items of spending and delaying the passage of bills by proposing thousands of amendments. The reason? The Conservatives were demanding the Liberals expand current exemptions on carbon pricing, including removing the levy on all forms of heating fuel for general consumers as well as farmers and Indigenous communities. The Liberals did not do that. And while the voting extended well into Saturday, all of the money was still approved. Business in the House of Commons has proceeded as usual so far this week.
And now the liberals are pointing out each and every one of the spending items Polyev's conservatives voted against. In the survey, support for the conservatives came out at 37% down from 42% in the last survey. Support from the liberals was at 27% up from 23. Support for the NDP was steady at 19. Now here's the next two paragraphs that I want you to pay attention to, kids. At the same time, of the 32% of voters who want a change of government but don't think there's an alternative, the poll found more people are now likely to vote liberal, 36%, than they were last month at 28%. So while the liberals have gone up 4% in their general support, among people who thought maybe it's time for change, they've gone up eight, mm -hmm. double. Meanwhile, among those who voted liberal in 2021, 66% said they'd do it again, up from 58%. That's another 8% against people who have voted liberal in the past and therefore might be likely to do it again. Those two numbers are huge. Oh, yes. And are not probably fully reflected in that 4% in general. But this is vote. These are people who do vote. And in 8% wow. of them more who think that maybe this should be time for a change, and 8% more of those who had voted liberal, there may be some intersection among those um, because there could have been people who voted liberal last time who thought it was time for a change. So it doesn't mean it's not a clear 16%, but it's double. Mm -hmm. Both of those numbers, 8, are double the 4% they went up. Quote, I think this is an indicator that the conservatives can't take victory to the bank, that there are voters out there who are paying attention and are genuinely on the fence, perhaps not fully comfortable with the conservatives and not ready to give the liberals another shot. And that's what 2024, I think, is going to be about, the fight over those voters. And that is with our media, very conservative mm -hmm. dominated, soft peddling all of this. And yet, Canadians are still noticing. Well, and remember, the whole filibuster thing was about axing the carbon tax, right? So we can bring home powerful paychecks and bring home groceries to Canadians. And um, how many articles have we read now that carbon tax accounts for 0.3% increase in food prices? That's 30 cents on a $100 grocery bill. Yep. Remember that? The next time you're promised affordability to the grocery store by axing the carbon tax. I can guarantee you that your insurance, your home insurance rates are going to go up more than that. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Whew. we got to wrap up. I have to get into the office. It is 20 after, and I have a 10-minute walk ahead of me. So, Yep. Yep. All right, kids. We hope that you loved this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show because we loved making it for you. And I especially love it when I get to bring you prezzies. Delicious, delicious prezzies. Ah, because sharing is caring. Make sure you tell everybody about this, your peeps, your poops, everyone. And we know that you do do it because we are growing and your word of mouth is priceless. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, well, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Curl. You just go to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And that way, when you subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we make sure it goes right into your box. And if you would like to help us even more, because our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page has now reached 500, which means now we're aiming for 1,000. We need your help. So you go there and you make like Kit Elaine and you smash with one, two, or three of our buttons, like share, subscribe, which are our three favorite words other than... Free beer yes, today. Yes, you right on cue, Mr. Grizzly. And if you would like to make sure that we do get some free beer today, because the only time I get free beer is when I lose at curling. And I don't like losing at curling. So if you would like to make sure that we have free beer today, that little squiggly by Mr. Grizzly's head there, well, that brings you to the emergency hydration fund that allows us to keep our vocal cords 
moist so that we can bring you this product. If you go there, you will find our tip jar and you can leave a contribution and we appreciate it very, 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 very much. If you would like to write to us, our email is truenortheagerbeaver at gmail.com. If you're listening on Apple, please, stars and reviews. Five is a beautiful number, but hey, give us what you think we deserve. And from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, oh, well, because democracy is something that you do. Write your MPs, get your XPB shots to help keep our hospitals unclogged. All right? Very, very important. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom. Uh, I don't really have words of wisdom other than I just wanted to uh, let uh, folks know who were not aware that the um, actor Andre Brogger yes. uh, passed away yesterday. He was a uh, formerly star of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, brilliant comedian and brilliant dramatic actor in Homicide Life on the Street. 61 years of age, too young to go, uh, was a charming fellow and a great actor. Absolutely. And he will be missed. And we steal a lot from his show every time I say title of your sex tape. <laughs> All right, Mr. Grizzly, roll them credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver media podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community and forum, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from fresh farm ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Welcome to the place where everyone knows your name, where everyone's your friend, where good times are had by all. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a beverage and enjoy our company. I know we'll certainly enjoy yours. Welcome to the True North Eager Beaver Pubcast. Once a month, we gather at the Lieutenant's Pump at 361 Elgin Street in downtown Ottawa, Canada's capital city, bringing you joy and happiness all day long.